The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome to the Oh Gladsome Light Podcast. This program contains preaching and teaching from an Orthodox Christian perspective to help you in your walk with Jesus Christ and to be victorious in Him. Welcome to the show. It's Oh Gladsome Light here every Monday at noon on WF4CY.com with a simultaneous broadcast on K4HD in Hollywood, California, and also W4VET. So we're on three platforms right there. And also we have a Skype address of W4CY Radio with a live call-in number of 561-623-9429. 561-623-9429. And going to the W4CY.com website, you can get into the chat room and chat with us. So I think I about covered it all, Chad. Yes, sir. So today's subject is... Our topic for the show is called, Who Do You Say That I Am? Who do you say that I am? It comes from the Holy Scripture. And I want to read a little bit about the story so you can get the uh, flavor of where we're going with this. Uh, now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others said Elijah, and others said Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, a Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ, which means the anointed one. So the show topic question. Who do you say that I am is probably the most, let's say, most important question, I think, in the universe, and the answer is relevant to your salvation of spending eternity in hell or spending eternity in heaven. Because what it does, it defines Christianity. Because what Peter confessed, that defines what Christianity is. Peter's correct answer to this question prevents the Christian faith from being seen as a merely another phil philosophical system or path of spirituality, which we have a lot today. I hear so many people say, well, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Really? Well, that's interesting. For it names Jesus as the only Son of the living God. This position excludes all compromise with other religious systems. Peter's understanding cannot be achieved by human reason. Okay, so it's outside of the human reason realm. But only by divine revelation through faith. Christ means the anointed one and is equivalent to the Hebrews word Messiah. But I want you to notice this, how the, the he asked who do people say that I am? And then they get the list. You know, I hey, uh, think you're John the Baptist or Elijah or maybe even Jeremiah or one of the prophets, okay? And so note this. This is whatever's in Scripture is very important, and we need to pay attention to what is written in the Holy Word of God. And Christ first draws out erroneous opinions about himself. 
He does this to identify these incorrect ideas as a person is better prepared to avoid false teachings when they are clearly identified. Understand, he made him go through the shopping list and wrong, wrong, wrong. Ben and Peter comes up and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And wow, uh, right there the Lord looks at Peter and says, You know, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So this is the greatest question a person could ever answer. And so I put it to, to the listening audience today, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And I, when I think about the I am, I think about God. Because you see, many times in Scripture, Jesus talks about I am the I am, you know. And so that caused a fervor and a fury within the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Because they are so, they're so uh, staunch on uh, waiting for the Messiah, and the Messiah comes, and they don't know. We want another one. We want another Messiah. Well, there's only get one Messiah, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? The one, the only begotten Son that the Father sent from heaven to dwell on this earth with sinful mankind for about 33 years before being offered up as a living sacrifice. He, he willingly went to the cross and died for the sins of mankind. Now, there's no way you can wrap your head around that because that is so big and so unimaginable that one man, the God-man, could die for the sins of the world. And so, who do you say that I am? That question I put to all who are viewing this video or listening to this radio show on W4CY. Now, if you can't listen live today at noon, you can always go to my website ogladsomelight.org, one word, ogladsomelight.org. Scroll down on the home page to come to iHeartRadio icon. You click on that, and that will give you a archived list of shows that are posted on iHeart, so you can listen at any time. You can listen on your cell phone, your smartphone. You can listen on the laptop. I mean, we have many ways that you can get this message into your ears and into your heart, so don't delay. Now there's something very interesting I want to talk about. See, we got we got P Peter saying, "Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God," and, and the Lord is saying, "Thumbs up, Peter, you got it right. That's the right answer." And all the other guys are saying, "We thought we had the right answer." No, Peter did. Okay, so don't get too revved up about Peter being all that because as I unfold this show today, you're going to find out that Peter was a sinful man, just like we are, but he was an apostle. And the Lord said, uh, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you loose, it will be loosed. Everything, anything you bind will be bound. And that's quite a bit of power, that spiritual power that Peter had. And I believe all the apostles had that same, that same power. But it's interesting. The Lord says he called Peter. Let me see if I can find that. I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay, so what is that? What, is, what does that mean, Peter, in a rock? What does all that mean? Well, if you do a, a concordance check, and if you go into an interlinear Bible that is, has the Greek in it, you find out that there's two words. The name Peter which is my baptism name, Petros, isn't in the Greek, Petros. And if you continue to look at the scriptures, you find a word called Petra, which means rock. So there's two different things going on here. Okay, so in the Greek and the Aramaic, those words are similar, Petros and Petra. Now, the rock is about the faith of his confession, okay? The true rock, of course, is Christ's Jesus himself, okay? And the church is built on the faithful confession of Christ. That's why the show topic says, who do you say that I am? Okay, do you agree with Peter that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, or not? Your future depends on it. So, so if Peter's the, is, if Petros 
is upon the, he says, upon the Petra, the rock, I will build my church. It's not on a man. It's not on the man. It's on the divine revelation from heaven on who Christ. See, you can't know who Jesus is unless God the Father reveals that to you. Well, that sounds like that's on fear. Well, it is because who, who makes all the rules? God the Father makes all the rules, and we either abide by them or not. We have a free will. We can say, nah, I don't think so. I think I'll, uh, I'll do it my way. And there's even a song that Frank Sinatra sang, I did it my way. And that's, I, I listen to the words of that song, and I say, wow. I'll tell you what, I'd like to change those words to say I did it God's way and not my way. You know, everybody likes to hear that song, but it's all about, I think it's all about uh, re re denying God and doing things on your own and, and resisting the, the hand of God in your life. So, the true rock is Christ himself. Remember the scripture talks about uh, if Jesus being the rock, okay, and if you fall upon that rock and are broken, that's good. That's a good thing. But if you resist Jesus and you kick against that, that truth and the rock falls on you, then you will be crushed to powder and gone. You're gone. You, you won't make it into heaven. I mean, there's got to be someone that's going to stand behind, uh, stand up and say, listen, friends and neighbors, it's Jesus or nothing. And I know I'm going to get resistance on that because everybody wants to find their own way into heaven, but God has already provided it through Jesus Christ. Why do you think of all the men that were crucified in Jerusalem, one cross stands out above all crosses, the one in the middle? I mean, the, the Appian Way was lined with crosses, but there's only one cross that when we say the cross, we, we all know it's talking about the cross that Christ endured for us to take care of the sin problem, okay? This, all the sins of the world, past, present, and future. If you can wrap your head around that, I mean, that's, there's, that's where a lot of faith has to come in and, and say, okay, uh, this is the Word of God. This is what the Lord says. I have to either agree with it or not. Just as Peter says, you know, when he confessed that Christ was, the, was you know, he, he was the Christ. He was the, the son of the living God. He was the anointed one that God had provided for the salvation of mankind. That free gift that we have to come and take. We have to come and receive that free gift. Because if we don't take the free gift, you know, it's like getting a, a birthday invite to go to a birthday party and you don't go. The, you got the invitation, but you didn't go. So what's all that? You're sitting at home looking at your invitation, but the birthday party's going on. So you, you never, you know, you don't participate. So we've been, we all have been given. We all have been given an invitation. Take it. Respond to it. And all that, in other words, cash it in and be there. Okay? Be there. Now, uh, I want to talk, talk about a little bit in that, in that passage of Scripture, which I just read, that if you notice in that Scripture that a uh, few verses down, uh, Jesus is talking about he has to die and you know, go to the cross and die and, and be lifted up. And then Peter says, God forbid, you know. And uh, what did the Lord say to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. And just a few verses up from that, he, he praised Peter for having the right answer, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And a few verses down, Peter slips back into his uh, humanity, I guess, uh, and or his, uh, his natural understanding, and the Lord has to chide him. Get thee behind me, Satan, because the whole purpose of Jesus coming to the earth was to be that, that, that perfect sacrifice that God and Father would accept in heaven. All right. Now, the term church, which is ecclesia. Now, uh, in the Greek word, ecclesia, what does that really mean, that Greek word? You hear about church. You can drive down the street and say, the church of God, the church of this, church, church, church. You can see it everywhere. But what does that word really mean? And in the Greek, ecclesia means something outside of you calls you to itself. That's what the word ecclesia means. And so you've got to ask yourself that question, did that happen to me? Did I 
respond to something outside of me that draws me to itself? That would be God, okay? Now, interesting, uh, in the Scripture, the word church, ecclesia, only shows up twice in all the Gospels. It's here in this, in this passage in John, I think it's uh, chapter 16, and then also in 18. And I'm going to read that verse 18 in a moment, uh, chapter 18. The church is the true Israel and is the body of Christ. Her citizenship is, of course, heaven. If you are in the ecclesia, if you in the, are in the church, can you remember Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my. I emphasize that word my because not every church is the Lord's church. Unless that process has happened to you or you've responded to that invitation, you may think you're in the church, but you're not. Let me read Matthew 18 here. Oh, that came out of Matthew 16, I'm sorry. Uh, Matthew uh, chapter 16. Now, here's Matthew 18. Uh, in dealing with sin in the church, I'm going to read uh, the other appearance of the word church. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. And that requires humility on that person's part. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church, the body of Christ, the ecclesia. And if they still refuse to listen even to the church, treat them, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And again, truly I, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So there's some precious truths there that I just ran over. I'm not going to uh, just expose to you, but I'm not going to uh, major on these. I just wanted to show you Matthew 18, uh, where the, other, the word church rolls into another you know, part of the gospel. Okay? Now, the examples of Jesus Christ being recognized throughout the Gospels are numerous. According to Luke, we learn that the Virgin Mary went to visit Elizabeth, her cousin. Upon entering Zechariah's house and hearing the Virgin Mary's greeting, the unborn baby, who was St. John the Baptist, leaped in, the, in Elizabeth's womb. Do you know that, there is, that's an, that that account there proves that John was already filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, he was the forerunner, the prophet that God had sent to make way and straight path uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. After Jesus Christ's birth, we read in the Gospel according to Matthew, the Magi are asking, where is, that, where is he that is born the King of the Jews? Where did they get that from? In Mark, Jesus had entered Capernaum and was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath and healed a man possessed by an unclean spirit. Before the unclean spirit departed from this man, he cried out, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Can you imagine that demons actually confess who Jesus is? And here we are, mankind, and we're, we don't want to confess that. So it sounds like the demons are smarter than us, you know. Does that sound like that, Chad? Are the demons smarter than us if we go off and, and, and deny the Lord? No, the demons are not smarter than us. Well, why would, why would they confess Jesus Christ being the Holy One of God and then people out here don't? Well, in that, in that in aspect. That, yeah, in that case, you know. Yeah, so, so that, that's why you know, it says in Scripture that uh, the, the demons believe and shudder. Do we? Do we shudder? You should. We should shudder. And it's more than just belief. It's a walk that uh, it, you can go back to my my iHeartRadio uh, links, and and there's many many uh, topics on there that talk about uh, living the Christian life in dynamics, and not uh, not a it's not a stale, stagnant uh, like the Dead Sea. You know that the 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 Dead Sea doesn't have an exit. Water comes in and it's dead, and that's like a, that'd be like a, a so-called Christian without you know. It's I will fill you with living waters, and then you share that. You don't keep it to yourself. 
by having an entry and an exit. How else are you going to grow in, in the Lord Not sh- without sharing the good news of what God has done in your life? I mean, think about what he's done. Just one thing. He brought you out of death into life. That's what he did. Our, char- our church blesses us with examples of, in the lives of the saints who recognized Jesus Christ. Now, as an example, our church on October 16th commemorates Longinus, the centurion, who pierced the side of the Lord when he was hanging on the cross. And he says, truly, this was the Son of God. Made an exclamation there, didn't he? Shortly thereafter, Longinus, the centurion, renounced his military position, returned to Cappadocia, where he was raised and joined the disciples to preach and teach the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if he was hunted down by the Roman army and killed for doing that, but it's usually once you're in the Roman guard and given a title of centurion, I think you're pretty accountable. And if you go off the deep end and become a religious fanatic, that uh, you're gonna you're gonna be run. You're going to get run down, you know, and taken. They're going to say, how dare you uh, do that to Caesar? It's not enough as Orthodox Christians to simply recognize Jesus Christ. We see that even the demons recognize that Christ is the Holy One of God. We must also believe in him as the Son of God who died for our sins of each of us and establish a personal covenant relationship with him. Remember, I said covenant. It's not just a personal relationship, but there are covenant rules that apply. If if we follow, if we uh, are following God, He is a covenant-making God, and it's all through Scripture. And I have many radio shows where I talked about what is covenant, and so you need to go look at the history in iHeart and pull up these covenant radio shows and learn more about covenant relationship. All three of the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, state what is needed to establish a covenant relationship with Christ. Three things. Deny ourselves takes humility. Take up our cross and follow who? Jesus. Okay? That's what you have to do. Now, let me focus a little bit back on Peter because we're talking about Peter's in, uh, dialogue with Jesus and Jesus saying, you know, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father was in heaven. So how did they really meet? Let me give you a little history on that. First, we meet St. Andrew. And he in the Orthodox Church is called, the, uh, we call him the first called. He was called by Christ. He was the first responded to the call. Now, St. Andrew a spiritual seeker in the first chapter of of St. John's Gospel. Originally a disciple of St. John the Baptist, Andrew is there when Jesus, John prophesies of the Lord Jesus. Remember what John the Baptist said when Jesus came down to be baptized, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Andrew and another disciple leave their first master, John, and go and follow someone far more important. Jesus invites Andrew and his friend to come and see. And the two of them spend the rest of the day with this mysterious new master, learning from him and observing his manner of life. I, I thought that was interesting. This says observing his manner of life. So there's no hypocrisy in the Lord. As with us, uh, I think we're shot through with hypocrisy. Uh, we say one thing and do another. You know, that's a Greek word too, hypocrisy. Andrew is not one to keep the good news to himself, which that rolls over to all of us. We should not keep this good news to ourselves. okay? Do you take a lamp and stick it under a bushel basket, or do you let the lamp do its job and shine forth, okay? What good is a lighthouse? If it lighthouse, if someone turned the switch to off, what good is that lighthouse? What good is your lamp if you bury it under a bushel basket? After spending the day with Rabbi Jesus, which means teacher, the first thing that Andrew uh, does is go and tell his brother Peter, we have found the Messiah. 
Well, you know, there's a lot of that going on back in the day because there's messiahs all over the place, and now uh, this is supposed to be the messiah. Remember, there's many that say, I am Jesus, I am the Christ, and they'll, and they'll lead so many into, uh, lead them astray into destruction. That's why you need to know who the true Christ is. The gospel simply tells us, and he brought him to Jesus. Andrew was on his own humble quest for the truth, as we all should be. And when the truth came before him, Andrew and Peter recognized him and never looked back. Now you can figure they were working for their dad, you know, fishermen. All of a sudden they leave the nets. I wonder what the dad said about that. Where are you guys going? You going to go follow this madman? You know, because they need uh, the father needed the sons there to help them yank the nets in and pull out the fish and you know go to market and all that stuff. They left everything to follow the Lord. They left it all. And if you read in, in Scripture, you see that happens a lot when someone is really turned on in the spirit that uh, their life is totally changed. And I'm going to talk about that later too. Now another event in Peter's life: walking on the water. Right, so they're in the, you know, they're in a ship. You know, Jesus told them to go uh, get in the ship and go to the other side, and he sent the multitudes away that were, you know, listening to his sermons and stuff. And Jesus goes up on the mountain to pray, and he's up there for quite a while. And so, you know, later on, uh, you know, the ship was in. The, now the ship is in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. Okay, and the disciples saw him walking on the sea, and they were troubled saying, it's a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straight away Jesus spoke of them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come out on the water to you. What a bold request to Jesus. Now, you know you can't walk on water. If you step, if you try, you're gonna, your feet will stay on the bottom, you know, against the sand. But here is the faith of Peter. He's seeing the Lord, and he loves the Lord so much that he's, he asked the Lord, bid me to come to you. And it wasn't because he wanted to walk. He had no idea he was going to walk on the water. He just wanted to come to the, be with the Lord, okay? And so he walks on the water. But then you know the story. He starts looking left, looking right, looking down, saying, well, this is unnatural. And what happens? He starts to sink. And what does he say that we all should say? Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were, now can you imagine, they walked back to the ship on top of the water, Jesus and Peter. Okay, and they came back into the ship. The wind ceased. They that were in the ship came and worshiped Christ, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So we'll look at that. They had, they had church in that boat in a contrary sea. You can have, look at that. Isn't that amazing? They all got together and they worshiped the Son of God. Did Jesus stop them? No. He did not say, don't, oh, don't do that. I'm not the Son of God. No, don't do it. No, he didn't stop them. And they worshiped him saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Now there's another spot. Now I want to talk about the humanity of Peter here for a moment. Remember when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and Judas comes up and kisses him, so let's the, let's the guard know who they're coming to take. And what did Peter do? He pulled out a sword. And what did he do? Whack! He whacked an ear off. And what did Jesus do? He reached down, picked up the ear, and stuck it back on the guy's head. He says, Peter, if you're going to live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Put your sword back in its scabbard. And, and Peter did. So uh, he gets arrested, and then, you know, Peter, loving the Lord, kind of tagged along, but at a distance, you know. And so uh, Simon Peter followed Jesus, so did uh, other disciples. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door, so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch of the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you are also, you also are not one of these man's disciples, are you? He says, I am not. There is a first denial. 
Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves, and Peter was also standing with them. And you know, while Peter's standing there, guess where Jesus is at? He's standing before Annas and Caiaphas and being interrogated. And then, you know, during this, during this whole process, you know, of interrogation, which I call a kangaroo court, you know, Jesus even says, I've always taught in the synagogues, in the temple openly, where all the Jews come together. I have, that, I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? And those who have heard me, what is I said to them, they know what I said. What, when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him and says, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But, I, but if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas was then sent him bound to Caiaphas to the, uh, to the, you know, the high priest at that time. Now there's another denial. Now Simon Peter, when he was standing and warming himself, so he said to him, you also are not one of the disciples, are you? And he denied it. I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, didn't I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again, again says, I deny that. And then guess what happens? The rooster crows, and guess what happens to Peter? He realizes the Lord, what he prophesied to him, came to pass. And there it is. Peter whipped bitter tears, okay, of repentance. He said he loved the Lord. He said even, he even boasted that I will, I will die with you, Lord. You know, will you? Well, there, uh, there was a test of his humanity right there of uh Wow, I better not say too much because next thing they're, they're going to arrest me too. So he's trying to save his own hide, I guess, by denying the Lord three times. And then the rooster call, crows, and then Peter knows in his heart that he has denied the Lord. You know, we, have a, we do the same thing. I'm not trying to say uh, that we, can't, we have that opportunity to deny the Lord or to you know, lift him up. And he, he even he, I just reminds me of the scripture. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men on myself to myself. And it, he was lifted up on that cruel cross. Jesus was lifted up, and then forty days later, after his resurrection, he ascends into heaven, and and the the, uh, the apostles there see that that whole event as Jesus is ascending into heaven, and then the angel is saying, "What are you looking at? What are you what are you looking at?" And they're marveling at that. He said, just as he ascended, he will come again to the same spot. And I believe that could be the Mount of Olives, you know, where he wept bitter tears before his, his arrest and his crucifixion and before standing before Pilate. So what's the difference between Peter and Judas Iscariot? I mean, Judas sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver, which was uh, the price of a, you know, uh, you know, it was prophesied that he would do that. I mean, even Jesus even said, and you know, Judas had to leave uh, the, the upper room. He said, go and do what you have to do. And Jesus even said that uh, Satan has entered his heart. So here's Judas. Uh, he could have repented. He could have. He threw the money back in the temple. So that's a, maybe the beginning of his repentance. But then he was so overwhelmed with grief that he went out and hung himself. And that branch broke, and he fell into the a field and burst his, burst open, and you know they call it the field of blood today. In in the Hebrew, it's called uh, Hakaldama. And if you ever visit Israel and go to Jerusalem, that still exists today. That actual uh, cemetery that uh, Judas fell into. I mean, Judas could have repented, even though it says Satan had filled his heart. With God, all things are possible. You know, with man, things are impossible. So I'm going to go on here. Uh, after the resurrection, and Jesus is on, uh, on the beach having a fish cookout. And the, and the boys are, you know, all the disciples are in the boat fishing. And they see, look at that. One guy says, that, is that the Lord over there? And Peter knows it. And what does he do? He jumps in the boat, in the water, from the boat into the water and swims in 
And then, of course, the boat comes in, too, uh, later. And they have, a, they have a meal together. Jesus, the resurrected Christ, sits down and has fish, has a cookout. Imagine that fish must have tasted really good, <laughs> having that barbecue on the beach. I've never done that on the beach. I've never had a barbecue on the beach, a fish barbecue. But anyway, that's, uh, that, I thought that was kind of kind of neat. The Lord uh, was breaking bread with his uh, disciples, his apostles. But during that time in John 21, uh, it was morning. It says here in Scripture, of uh, cha- uh, chapter 21, verse 15, when they had finished breakfast. So that was morning. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, the son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to them, he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Have you ever wondered about that passage in Scripture, why Jesus said to, that, said to him three times, feed my sheep? Well, if you go into Greek and look at the words, the special of the words, love me, there's a key of what was going on there. The first time Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And he, the word is agape. And that word agape is a, mo, is a godly kind of love, which is, is a self-sacrificing love, denying yourself and, and, and keeping your eyes focused on, on the Lord. It is, a, is the highest level of love you can ever attain. And you can only do it in the spirit realm. You can't do it in the flesh. You cannot do it in the soul. It has to be done in the spirit. So Jesus asked him, do you love me, agape, uh, self, will you sacrifice yourself for me? This kind of love. And then Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. And he used a different word called philo. It means a term of endearment, a, fr- a friendship. That's not what the Lord is asking him, is he? He's asking him, do you love me, agape? Will you sacrifice yourself for me? Will you preach the good news? Will you be my uh, disciple or my apostle and go out and hazard your life for, for me and share the good news of the gospel of the kingdom? And Peter says, I, I love you, Lord, but only at the next at the level down. So he said to him a second time, Simon, do you love me? Agape, that self-sacrificing love. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, Philo. Not able to reach to that level of love. And he said to him a third time, Simon, do you love me? And Jesus then changes the word to Philo. And Peter was grieved because he realizes to him he realized in his own self that what Jesus was asking him, he could not get there yet. He wasn't at that level. Because he could only respond with the philo, the friendship, the endearment, not the agape, the sacrificing. So the Lord met Peter at his level, and that's what happens with us. The Lord will meet us at our level. But we won't stay there. See, and now as I continue this, now if you continue this this passage in verse eighteen and nineteen, it, it says, "The Lord says to Peter, Verily, verily, I say unto you, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walked where wherever you wanted to walk. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands." And another shall gird thee and carry thee where you don't want to go. This spoke he, signifying by what death he should glorify God in. So we know that Peter, when he got older, was imprisoned. He was kept in a, in a prison. And what happened to Peter? If you all know your scriptures, you know that Peter was led out to be crucified, just like his Lord. But what did Peter say before they could crucify him? 
He said, I am not worthy that I should be crucified as my Lord. And they crucified him upside down. And so I've, did he glorify God in his death? I mean, I look at you look at the saints that have gone before us, how they have given it all up. I mean, there's there's so many uh, saints that we know in in the Orthodox Church that have left it all and gone into the woods and become hermits or uh, aesthetics. And and when they had when they were lit up with the Holy Spirit, it totally changed their life. They're no longer the same. Okay. So let me let me go back here in a little review here about this, you know. First of all, the first requirement is you must agree with Peter's statement. Who do you say that I am? I hope you have the same answer as Peter had. Because if it's not, it's it's game over right there. If you don't confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, it's over. Does that sound too harsh? But that's what the scriptures teach us. But let's say you answer with that correct, the correct, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is a son of the living God, the anointed one. So now you can begin the journey. Peter was not perfect. He just knew how to repent and seek forgiveness. Judas did not. So this, what I'm saying here, needs to apply to each one of us here, that you need to repent and seek forgiveness because all of us, we have a sinful nature. We come in and we trust God. We, we take the free gift of salvation, and guess what? We don't stay in that. Yes, we came from sin, a sinful nature, but did not God create a new thing in us? When you're born again, aren't you a new creation in Christ? Or you still want to waller in the hog pen like the prodigal did until he woke up and came back to the Father. And the Father didn't reject him. He put a robe on his, on his, on his back and gave him a ring, of, a, put a nice gold ring on his finger, and they, and they, they uh, had, a, had a barbecue, had a big party. Your love must grow into agape love, not just a philo love. And that, that what I did, tried to t define to you is the difference between agape and philo. Agape is that self-sacrificing, giving it all to God, not holding anything back. Where, you know, we have friends, and we have different levels of friendship. But who's your true friend? When you in the relationships we have on this earth, we have friends and acquaintances and so forth. But who's your real friend? I guess one way to find out is say, "Hey, I'm moving. I need your help." Where did all my friends go? I, I thought you wanted to help me move. I, well, I'm busy. So that's one way of kind of figuring out who your friend is. But you know, a friend will not talk behind your back. He's got your back. But this agape love is what we're going for. And the only way we can get to that is through that theosis process, which I have talked about in many shows, that letting God work within you to bring you up to that level of agape love. And he did it with Peter. Because Peter became all he could be in God. Okay, what happened at Pentecost? What happened? You know, Peter's first sermon at Pentecost, what happened? He was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And he went forth and he stood in the, in the center of Jerusalem and he preached out of the Old Testament. And people were so pricked in their hearts, he says, people were saying, what should we do to be saved? And Peter doesn't hide it from him. He says, repent and be baptized. 3,000 were added to the church that day. Isn't that amazing? 3,000 were added that day. Now, this is after Pentecost. The Lord has been resurrected, he ascended. He says, hang in Jerusalem for 10 days until I send the Comforter. And the Holy Spirit comes as a mighty rushing wind. Uh, the cloven tongues of fire descend upon the apostles. And they were filled with power from on high. And with the Holy Spirit could go forth and preach the good news, even if it meant imprisonment or death. 
St. Paul was a good, a good example of that. You know, he was a Christian killer, and on the way to Damascus, what happened? The Lord knocks him off the horse, blinds him. He goes into a, a house, sits there for three days, doesn't eat nothing or, or drink anything. Ananias comes by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, prays for him. The, 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 the scales drop off his eyes. He goes out into the desert, and he hangs with the Lord for three years and gets his own catechism, the true catechism of the Lord. He comes back, and he unites with Peter, and then they go out and they have their mission, you know, of going out to the world in different regions and preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel. And, I mean, this is what happens when you allow the Holy Spirit to invade your life. It's not a forced job, okay? Uh, it's not forced. We are free will agents. We can choose good and evil. I mean, Look at what it says in the Old Testament. It says that I lay before you blessings and curses. And I hope, the Lord said, I hope you will go with the blessing and live. But you can choose to curse and die. But still loving God. Because if you find yourself in hell, don't blame God. Because you sent yourself there. And that applies to me. Because day, I, have a daily, I have a daily maintenance with my soul and my spirit to always try to stay clean and confess, repent, and stay in, in the good graces of God because if you are in covenant relationship with him, there are rules and regulations to the covenant. And I know that Jesus made covenant with the Father at the cross for us. And so if you, and we're going to break covenant because if you break covenant, you die. Okay, but Jesus, being God, won't break covenant. Just as Abraham or Abram before he was his name was changed, God made covenant with Abraham, but he knew that he couldn't keep the covenant, so he put him to sleep. And God made covenant for him, just like Jesus did at the cross. Isn't that great to know that we have that parallels in the Old Testament and the New Testament of how God works with His creation? So it's up to you. That's up to us, you know, to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him and and people you tell them that you tell them hey god deny yourself no no their pride kicks in and says, i'm not going to do that oh yeah well guess what if you're not humble you don't attract god if you're prideful again god will resist you now are you stronger than god i don't think so because someday there's going to be a stand before a judgment seat we all going to stand there and we're going to have to give an accounting for every word we can you believe that every word that we speak we have to give an accounting uh, and and i'm gonna have to say lord you know there's a lot of stuff i didn't do in the spirit and, and forgive me for that because there talks about in scripture about uh you can either send wood hay and stubble up or you can send gold, silver, and precious stones up. And that gold and that silver and those precious stones that you're sending up to heaven as building materials are the things you've done in the Holy Spirit and not of your own. Because the Lord, he's like a fire marshal. He's going to set your building on fire and see what's left. And that's not, he knows, the Lord already knows. He already knew about Peter, you know, about he would, he would move into agape love and not philo love. He would move into that agape love, that self-sacrificing love, and, and become a, a sacrifice for the glory of God by sharing the gospel. Can you imagine today if we tried to share the gospel and they did that, did that to us, threw us in prison, or, or, or crucified us? How many would share the gospel? We'd find out who the real Christians are, wouldn't we? Not the wannabes. And so let me close the show with this to tell you today. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And follow me, saith the Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening to the O Gladsome Light Podcast. We hope this program has encouraged you to fight the good fight of faith and walk in the accordance with the commandments of our Lord. May God bless you on your journey to salvation.